Welcome to Next Gen Leaders. My name is Sam Belichev, and I'm once again excited and glad, and even humbled, that you have given the opportunity to once again impart wisdom, knowledge, and revelation into your personal life as we continue to dive further into this curriculum and going into lesson number two, which is titled The Heart of a Leader. And this is uh, the foundations to successful leadership. And in this lesson, we're going to go deep uh, into uh, insight uh, and practical life lessons and applications where it relates personally to our heart. And obviously when we look at the life of Jesus, everything and anything Jesus did was not out of just his good feelings, it was done out of his heart and out of the spirit of his heart. And I think truly that if we can, we can understand the concept and the purpose and the reasons why leadership is so important and why we need to do all these things, that means we'll understand the success and full patterns of leadership and we'll understand why some leaders are successful and why some leaders are not successful. So in this specific outline, we're going to go and we're going to look into our hearts because as the scripture relates that where our heart is, that's where our treasure will also be. So in the beginning, you know, I have this uh, leadership stand verbs, which I usually do in every uh, lesson outline. This one specifically says this, the leader is willing to serve while the follower is willing to be served. So once again, this has to do with the heart, with the mindset and ad attitude of a leader. And the question is, do you truly want to serve? Whether you're a pastor, uh, whether you're involved in some kind of ministry, or you're just a child of God, an average Christian, or just a person who wants to serve God, everything goes down to our heart. Are you willing to serve your fellow brother and sister of the Lord? Are you, actually, are you willing to serve anyone? They don't have to be even a Christian. And this all comes down to these simple things. Do I have a servant's heart, or am I in a position where I want others to serve me, where I want others to do good things to me? And in Proverbs, one of the best uh, scriptures concerning uh, our heart and concerning things of that nature says this, Proverbs uh, uh, 423 and we're actually on page 2.1 every lesson has an outline and whatever um, electronic device you might be using right now there's an opportunity for you to download this PDF and I encourage you to do so where you can follow along and if you even have one of these curriculums with you even much better and we can follow on so page 2.1 we read this in Proverbs 423 keep your heart with all diligence for out of it springs the issues of life now, when the scripture oftentimes, or most of the time, talks about the heart, it's not talking about our physical heart. It's talking about our internal heart, where it's tied down to our heart, to our mind, to our soul, to our spirit man. That everything from the abundance of the heart, the scripture says, life will flow, living uh, waters will flow. So in this particular scripture, the, in Proverbs, he talks about that. Look, keep your heart with all diligence, because out of it springs the issues of life. So what does that mean? Just as the heart is the most important member of our physical body... So it is the same towards leadership. Now, if we have an issue with our arm and there's some kind of a disease or if there's maybe cancer in the arm or some kind of serious infection and the doctor says we need to amputate the arm, sure, we can have the arm amputated and we can go without one arm. We can actually go without two arms, we go without a leg, two legs, without an ear, without a nose, without an eye. Many physical body parts we can actually go about and live without. But what happens when your heart is no longer functioning, your physical heart? As soon as your heart malfunctions, you'll either have a stroke, a heart attack, or if your heart stops beating, then that's it. Then life leaves your body because your, our heart, our physical heart is literally the most important factor uh, that gives uh, our whole body life that we can breathe, talk, and so on and so forth. So just as much as our hearts are so important, it also means to our internal hearts that when our heart, our character, when our mindset, when we have the attitude to serve others, when we have a deep inside of our heart that we want to do something good unto God and unto our fellow man, that means out of that will determine many other things. So it's very important that uh, when it comes to leadership, that we do things out of our heart, out of the integrity of our heart, not out of our thought because, well, I'm a leader, I'm a pastor, I'm a minister, I'm the man of the house, I'm the boss here, I'm the manager here. No, no, no. Everything needs to come out of our internal heart. So as we continue, the next bulletin point says this, the heart of every leader contains who they are, their character, their passion, their attitude, and their motives, and their nature. So literally, here's the description concerning that heart that I'm referring to in leadership. So that contains to what? Who we are as an individual, our character, or our characteristics, our passion, what is our passion, what is our inner drive, what is that that uh, moves us forward, what is that that gives us this inner drive to continue to do what we're doing, our attitude, 
Our attitude is, is our belief system. Our attitude is how we look at life. Our attitude is how we, uh, how we want to do certain and specific things. And that will also reflect on whether we want to serve or we don't want to serve. And also concerning our inner nature. And also, most often, the heart of an individual is noticed in their actions and in their words. This is something that, uh, especially if you're married, <laughs> and I probably used this example before in the previous lesson, uh, I'm glad for my wife and those of you, you know, who are married and men, uh, I'm sure you're very grateful also for your wives and also for our spouses. Even if you're, if you're a woman, you're watching this and you have a husband, that it's interesting. We oftentimes do not uh, notice or even recognize the type of words that we use and even what kind of body language is attached to our words and even the volume in our words that we can sometimes say certain things, not in, use only inappropriate words, but they come out of the wrong heart. They come out with the wrong attitude. And usually in that case, my wife, if she's standing next to me, she'll pinch me or she'll give me the family the look. And I'm sure every married couple, they do have their own looks that whenever the husband says something wrong or just totally go, goes off the cliff and he just looks at his wife and his wife just gives him that gaze. And every husband usually knows whenever their wife gives them that look like, okay, you've blew it, it's time for you to quiet down or it's time for you to change the subject and etc. So here specifically that uh, it's in our actions and our words where you're able to see uh, the true characteristics of an individual or of a person. And if the person who is in a position of leadership in any sphere of life, that if they're status focused, if they're position focused, then you'll be able to see what comes out of their heart. They could be harsh. They could uh, express uh, envy and hatred towards their fellow man. Uh, they could be aggressive. Uh, they could have a very haughty and prideful heart. Even you can see it on their countenance, on their face, that just by looking at your physical appearance of your boss, your manager, even you know, a church leader, and be like, oh, you know, I think this is a time for me not to bother him or her just by looking at their countenance, just looking at their physical appearance. Like, okay, it seems like they're not in a good mood. And I'm sure, you know, all of us, we have good days and bad days, but I'm not referring to that. I'm mostly focusing on that uh, we need to, when we... Uh, talk to people, when we uh, just have a conversation, it needs to be with season, it needs to be with love, it needs to be with compassion, especially, especially if the circumstances, situations uh, are, are awkward, are bad, and there's a problem, there's a situation, instead of you just coming out there with, with rage and with just envy and with the frustration, I can't believe this has happened, how come you didn't do this, how come you didn't do that, and I'm referring in every sphere of life, including your, your local churches, including within ministry, that we need to to approach these people, we need to approach these situations, we need to approach these problems that arise with a very meek and humble heart. Because, you know, for those of you who have children, you, you'll be able to understand very well that whenever your son or your daughter or your two children, they get into, you know, an argument, into a fight, whenever they cause some kind of damage within the home, of course, if it's something of great value or if something, you know, big happens and occurs and, you know, they mess up your sleep or, or, or you have guests over and they're totally interrupting. Of course, some of the common things or normal thing for any parent is just to react with frustration. And that's not right because the more we practice that or the more we do that in our families and our marriages, uh, it tends to become like a normal and common thing where children are like, oh boy, you know, just when I, when I did something wrong, I broke this or I shouldn't have done that. Here comes mom and dad. They're going to yell at me and scream at me. And they're already being prepared for that. Even not too long ago, I had that with one of my children that, you know, I raised my uh, volume, uh, uh, my voice with frustration towards them because of what they did. And their response like, well, why are you yelling at me? And I'm thinking, well, because you did this and this wrong. And then at the end of the conversation, I walked away, I'm like, well, you know, I could have not yelled at my uh, child. I could have just held back that frustration. So same thing here. When it comes to leadership, uh, our behavior, our body language, the way we talk, what we do, and uh, how we do things, how we say things, we'll be amazed. It's not because people are sensitive, but how they receive and interpret that will be totally different. So next bulletin point says this. There are more than 500 verses in the Bible that relate to our heart, in other words, our inner character. More than 500 verses. Whenever you have that time, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, you'll be able to go through those verses and passages that relate to our heart. I know King David talks a lot concerning his heart, concerning his life, concerning the things he was feeling. Literally, if we can just take the Psalms of David and just give them a specific category or specific title, we could call this specific Psalm, you know, David having a bad day. Or David having an argument with, with, with his wife or with one of his wives. 
or David having a frustrated uh, in, um, interaction or situation with one of his children, if we could just title him, because in, in each of those Psalms, and most of them, David just expresses his feelings in his heart. That's why a lot of the songs that we sing in our local churches, in very anointed songs, powerful lyrics in them, were actually taken from the passages of Psalms. Why? Because there's so much passion, so much emotion attached to them. And of course, a lot of it has to do with the heart. So what is the heart? If you, we continue page 2.1, it says that heart equals treasure. Or heart equals a person's nature and character. So whatever we store in this treasure bar box inside of our character, inside of our, uh, our spirit man, whatever is in here, every time we open that up, the question is, what kind of treasure are others going to see, or should I say even here? So and we, when we look at Matthew, I talk about uh, two different uh, translations, Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, and New King James Version says it this way, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. A very familiar verse to all of us. And another translation, which is NLT, New Living Translation, says this. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Interesting. Gives us a little more deeper perspective concerning our heart. So now the question for all of us is, especially for me and for you who's watching and listening to this, is what kind of treasure are we storing in our heart? What kind of treasure are we carrying in our life? Now, I'm not talking about us being perfect. Nobody's perfect. There's only one perfect, and that's Christ Jesus himself. I'm talking about what is it that we continually store in our hearts. And if we truly want to be a leader, if we truly want to be used by God in, in church, in ministry, as, a, as an entrepreneur, in your business, in every area and field of life, what kind of treasure are we bringing into the atmosphere? You know, I use this uh, example sometimes in different perspectives that I'm sure we've all at one point smelled a skunk. Or maybe, you know, if you're in school, a sting bomb. I'm not sure if they still even use them right now in schools. I'm sure they do. But, you know, it's very unpleasant smell. Or, if, you know, if, if, if somebody even smoking. You may not be allergic to it, but it's very unpleasant. And if you're around somebody, you know, who smoked and that smell get, gets on you, you can sense it in, in your clothing. And after they go, wow, man, what, what's the smell? And it's, you know, it's not pleasant to you. Whether it's the smell of cigarettes or, or, or some kind of stench or even a skunk, it's very unpleasant. And now the question with that said is concerning you and concerning me. Whenever we enter a, uh, a certain atmosphere, whenever we enter uh, into a certain uh, place, whether it's one people or group of people, what, and after we're done doing what we're doing and we leave, what kind of atmosphere did you leave there? So in other words, when you came to work and you've spoken to somebody, you've spoken to a co-worker, or maybe you're the boss and somebody came into your office, or you're a pastor, minister, a father, a mother, it doesn't matter, or, or somebody in school, whenever somebody was in your presence for a short period of time, how do they feel? Do they feel walking away, uplifted, encouraged, or do they feel walking away, oh man, that was just a bad conversation, that, you know, I just didn't want to be around you as an individual, whether it's, you know, the smell of the skunk or the smell of the cigarettes or, or another stench. In other words, this is so important that our treasure, as it's being opened up, you know, why does the term use treasure? Treasure is something that carries value. So as leaders, my friends, this is very important for us to understand and grasp, grasp this, that we are always there to enrich someone's life. Even if you might be going through a very tough season in your life, and this is something very important for you to grasp also. Sometimes we uh, create this delusion inside of us. Sometimes we uh, even, uh, if I can put it this way, uh, convince ourselves by saying, well, I'm going through a very difficult season in my life, or I'm going through a few struggles in marriage, or whatever the case may be. So I don't believe that God can use me to still add value to someone else. Well, no, especially if you have a daily job and you have to go to work, or if you run your own company, or, or you have to continue to interact with people. Look, we all go through life. But just because you're going through a certain season of your life or through certain struggles of your life, it does not mean that all of a sudden you hide yourself from people and from society. Well, stop going to work just because you're having some problems. Well, it's, you're probably going to get fired, you know, or you'll take a week worth of vacation. But if your circumstances have a change, what is that supposed to mean? That you need to hide from society and from everybody else? No, that's not true. So here we need to always understand that if Christ lives inside of us, if Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, lives inside of us, he's going to be always there like that sweet smell and aroma. So if you, if you might be going, even right now, as you're watching, listen to me through a difficult season of your life, ask God, ask the Holy Spirit, ask Jesus just to give you enough grace that when you move on to your everyday life, work, 
ministry or whatever you might be doing, say, Lord, give me that grace for this day. Even though you're going through a challenge or a difficult season of your personal life. And when you will be interacting with people or being around different places, that after you're done being there, that you'll be able to leave that treasurable value there. So as we continue further with these bulletin points below Matthew 6.21, it says this. One of the first questions we all need to ask is this. Where or who is my treasure? So now this, as we go a little further, we need to uh, always understand, okay, Lord, where am I continually being exposed to? So oftentimes, most of us were involved in some kind of a job. I use this often, and I will say it even again here, that about less than 3% of, of Christians uh, within the body of Christ are called to full-time ministry within the church. All the rest of us, you know, we're in the marketplace, we run businesses, we're in the corporate world, and etc. and etc. So now the question is this, you know, where or to whom are you called to? So if you go to work every day of your life, uh, to, to a stable job, or you run your own company, that means those people you, whom you continually on a daily basis surround yourself with, that means those are the people who become your treasure. And why is it very, uh, how can I say it this way? Uh, in a certain sense, uh, for some people, it might seem like very captivating and addictive to go on treasure hunts. When you say, okay, we're going to go on the treasure hunt. Uh, you know, it's exciting for the kids. Depends what you're trying to do with them. But at the same time, there's people who have made it almost their lifestyle to go on these different uh, treasure hunts throughout the whole world uh, to find certain treasure of certain value. Well, of course, because they'll be able to make money off it. But it's also the excitement of discovering, like archaeologists. You know, they're out there digging, you know, scraping away with brushes to find bones and, and, and other artifacts. And it's very awesome. And it's exciting for them, especially when they're able to discover something of great value over or of great worth or something that have, that is so old and then they'd be able to present it to public for somebody like you and me to see. We're like, wow, man, that thing is like a thousand years old, that artifact, so on and so forth. So this is one of the key factors that we always need to look at people like they are our treasure. Why? Because God looks at every human being like their priceless treasure. Why? Because God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for all of us. Yes, if you're saved, if you've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, that's awesome. That's great. That's amen. What about those people who work with you? What about those peers and students whom you go to uh, college to or to high school with? Or, or how about those employees that work for you? Or how about those people who will attend your church on Sunday morning service? Not everybody that's going to enter through the doors of your church is actually saved or they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So we need to always look at them as that priceless treasure, that they may not know about that, but we, uh, being as God's children, or especially in a position as leaders, we need to bring that value and worth to them. So, the question of where is this? Where defines my area and focus of work? And I, again, I addressed that a little bit earlier. And the question or the concept of who defines those individuals whom I need to focus upon. And I already talked about this a little earlier that whether it's your work, a job, or the whatever ministry you do, or especially if you're a missionary evangelist, that you go out there on the harvest field, knowing that there's thousands, even millions who have not, who have not known Jesus, who have not received them as their Lord and Savior. So this is very important. Where? Where am I being directed to on a daily basis? And who are those people that I need to go out there and let them know how treasured, how valuable they are, especially in the eyes of God. So let's continue. When we understand and discover what is within our heart, only then we'll be able to understand and discover what our treasure is. And I think this is one of the key components that maybe oftentimes people, not only leaders, just miss out on that because they haven't discovered that treasure and worth that God has already given them. First of all, that's eternity, that's life, that's salvation, the Holy Spirit, His Word. And because... We have not understood that, not even in its fullest sense. Now it's hard for us to try to go out there and to minister to someone else, to evangelize, to reach out to them, to make friendships, relationships, and to preach the kingdom message uh, to our fellow men, to our, our co-workers, to our peers, to our students, and etc. And this is very important for every individual, especially if you're going to be in a leadership position, that you first of all need to discover that potential and that treasure that's within you. Next, our heart is like a compass that will lead us to our treasure. Just like the GPS that will bring us to our destination. Like a compass where you see north, south, east, west, or, or the metal detector, or whatever other you know device that's used out there, sonars, and so on and so forth, to find that treasure in Dallas. And this is very important that our heart is what becomes like that treasure or like that flashlight in the midst of darkness. And next, 
The condition of our heart will determine what treasure you will attract. So if you have this complaining heart and attitude, well, guess what? If you're at work and you have quite a few fellow employees and you're just moaning, groaning, complaining about you know life and etc., you'll definitely find uh, a pair of ears that'll join you and say, hey, you know what, Stan, I do agree with you, man. This job is horrible. Life is horrible. Marriage is horrible. <laughs> you know. So this is very important for us to understand. What is it that I'm carrying in my heart? What kind of condition is it in my heart? And it's like a magnet. If you are in a magnet, you want to attract attract metallic pieces. Well, guess what? Then you have to be like the magnet to attract them. But if not, then the question is, who and what are you going to attract based on your heart and your condition? And as the saying goes, you are what you eat. That is also true concerning your heart. And you only attract what your heart desires and wants. It's like anyone else. If you're looking for trouble, trouble will find you. Now, does that mean that we're not going to spontaneously come across different situations and circumstances? But the question is this. What is it that you, you want to be attracted to? In other words, if we carry truly the heart of Christ, people will see it in us. And it's just a matter of time till somebody comes up and approaches you and says, You know what? I've been watching you. Me and you have been working in the same company for 10, 15, 20 years, and I've been watching you almost every day. I see the way you behave, the way you talk, the way you deal with anger, uh, with frustration, with being cut off the pay, or whenever hours being cut, or, or etc. And you always respond graciously. And for some people, it take maybe years for us to, to obtain them, and it take us years to actually win them over. And then when they begin to listen, what's in our heart, and this will be a good opportunity for us to minister and to tell them about Christ. And another thing is, if your heart is pure then your treasure or desire will be pure. But if your heart is evil and wicked, then your rewards will also be painful. So again, a lot has to do with what's in our heart. A lot has to do how uh, God can use us. And if our heart is truly humble, if our heart is truly full of that treasure of Christ and His Word and love, mercy, and grace, and forgiveness, it's of course, it be, will be much more easier for God to use us. But if our heart is wicked, if, if our character and just our nature, we're just grouchy, grumbling, well, guess what? People are going to walk away from us. Same thing as the magnet. Whenever you take the magnet and you flip it over another side and you put it with another magnet, all of a sudden it's not sticking. I think there's like a positive negative side to it. But thank you, my friends. So I'm going to conclude with this specific session. I'll be looking forward to continue in the next, next session where we're going to be focusing on different conditions of our hearts.